We are so pleased you've joined us today for St. Stephen's Online. We're praying for you as you watch this, wherever you're tuning in from. Lord God, be with us as we worship together and listen to today's talk. Where you're 
Why not open your Bible or click on the link below to read the passage before we hear from our speaker. It's a real privilege for me to be kickstarting this little mini series on the book of Ruth. Four weeks, four chapters in Ruth. Dave said to me this evening, our curate, he said, when you look at that, Rachel, does that not want, make you want to eat Weetabix? I don't want to divide a crowd, but um, nothing would make me want to eat Weetabix. <laughs> So uh, I hope that hasn't now made you just think Weetabix for my whole sermon. But um, if you've got a Bible, keep it open at Ruth 1 um, or pull it up on your phone. So it's important, isn't it, that when we go into the Old Testament, we remind ourselves that we are traveling to a completely different age, different culture and way of thinking. And I just want to kind of sketch that out a little bit for us this evening. So just to put Ruth in context, if you rewind back to the book of Exodus, we're reminded that God leads his people out of slavery in Egypt through the wilderness. There's lots of ups and downs, and eventually they end up in the promised land. They build the temple, and the people of Israel kind of flourish during that time. But what follows after that is recorded in the book of Judges, which comes just before Ruth. This is kind of the period historically between Joshua and Samuel. We're talking about sort of just over a thousand years before Christ. Now, if you read Judges, what you see there is this kind of catalog of the kind of downward spiral of Israel's national and spiritual life. They stumble because they don't really have a good judge to rule over them. Then, if you jump into Ruth, Ruth 1 verse 1 says this, the story takes time in the time of the judges. So it's putting Ruth in the middle of the judges. So what were some of the challenges of this time? Well, firstly, these people were completely reliant on agriculture. Okay, so good weather, good harvest, bad weather, bad harvest. Life was pretty precarious and dependent on the weather. Secondly, the people of Israel lived amongst many people who worshipped the god Baal. Now, they believed that this god Baal controlled the land, which they were completely reliant on, and was also responsible for the fertility of the land. So you've got the people of Israel kind of living amongst many people who are worshipping another god. So it's quite challenging for them to retain their identity and their faith in Yahweh, this god who had rescued them from slavery. Thirdly, if you read through Judges, to be honest, it's just a time of like quite a lot of evil. There's lots of violence and murder and war. In the second part in particular, there's just unrest all the time, kind of social disintegration and sexual immorality. Like it's a very challenging, pretty brutal time to live. And so this is the context in which Ruth sits, yeah? Verse one, right at the beginning, in the time of the judges. And whilst Judges paints this big picture of what is going on, the four short chapters of Ruth are like a kind of little microcosm. Okay, I love how the Bible does that sometimes, right? It tells us this like meta-narrative of God's work in history from beginning to end, and then it kind of zooms in on a really ordinary family. Gives us like a kind of worked example of real people with ordinary lives and relationships facing the kind of struggles and difficulties that we face. This is what's going on here. So let's look a little bit at the story. What happens in chapter one? Well, we're introduced to the main characters of the story. Firstly, you've got this guy, Elemenek, who is married to Naomi, and they have two sons, Marlon and Killian. They are worshippers of Yahweh, so they're within the people of Israel. But famine hits their hometown, which is in Bethlehem. I think we've got a little map. Here we go, Bethlehem there on the left-hand side. And so Elimelech decides to take his family from Bethlehem to go up there at the top of the Dead Sea and down into the land of Moab. Now, it actually doesn't really make sense that he chooses to go to Moab because the people in Moab worship a completely different god called the god of Chemosh. And so he, he decides to go and live amongst these people where um, they're going to be very much in the minority. We don't know why he did that, but that's what he chooses to do. Now, when they get there, Marlon and Killian, the songs, marry Moabite 
women. So we see the family then changes shape slightly. So you've got Marlon and, and um, Ruth and Killian and Orpah, and these women are Moabite women. And then tragically then, all the men die. So Elimelech, Marlon, <laughs> sorry about that, it's a bit brutal, but you know, he's trying to make my point visually. Um, and they, they all die. <laughs> Not funny. Um, <laughs> and so for these women who are left, life which was already incredibly precarious because it's based on the agriculture and the weather and the harvest and all that kind of stuff, is now even more precarious because they would have relied on the men to provide for them financially and now there aren't any men. So this is a problem for Naomi and Orpah and Ruth. A little bit of time passes, the famine ends, and Naomi decides that she's going to go back to Bethlehem. That's where her people are. You kind of get that, right? She's living amongst all these other people who worship another god. So she goes, I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. Now, Ruth and Orpah, these daughter-in-laws who are now widowed, they want to go with her, which is, again, slightly unusual. We wonder if they kind of had become maybe worshippers of Yahweh themselves and want to go back to Bethlehem. But she says, no, no, you stay with your people in Moab. And in the end, Orpah decides to stay and Ruth goes with Naomi and they travel back to Bethlehem together. It's basically what happens in chapter one. So why has this story of this little family, this one family amongst thousands why has it been included in the Bible? And what can we learn from it? Well, first point I want to make is this. Ruth reminds us that God is the God of the ordinary as much as of the big picture. As we read through Ruth, what you'll see is that in this story, there's material struggle. There's decisions about where to live. We've seen that even in just chapter one. There's death, there's marriage, there's more decisions, there's some money worries, there's family relationships, intimate relationships, there's work. It just includes all of these components of what it means to be human. The Bible tells the story of a mighty and all-powerful God who flung stars into space and who breathed life into all that is. And yet the Bible includes these little stories of these very ordinary families to show us that God is as interested in the minutiae of our lives as he is in the big picture stuff. This little family mattered. You matter. And God is interested in your life, however ordinary it might seem. In the same way that God spoke into this little family's life and wanted to shape it, so he wants to speak into your life and shape your life too. Secondly, I'd love for us just to think for a moment about the lenses through which we live our lives. Consider these glasses here. These are my glasses. Now, I have a very strong prescription. It's not going to work because I've got very strong contact lenses in. But when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I reach for is my glasses. It's like automate. Like I have to just put my glasses on because I can't see where I'm going otherwise. And it's through these lenses, or through my contact lenses, once I put them in, that I view the whole world. So without them, nothing about my life makes sense. I can't read, I can't drive, I can't recognize people, I can't use my phone because I'm both long and short-sighted, I can't use a computer. My lenses frame everything. And I want to say that our faith in God needs to be in our minds as necessary to our lives as these glasses are to me in my life. In other words, we need to imagine that we have a pair of spiritual glasses that we put on the very moment that we wake up that define everything about the rest of our day. It means that we view our every step, our relationships, our work, our decisions about where to live and where to study, who to spend time with through the lens of our faith in God. 
Our spiritual glasses need to be on before we read anything, before we consume any media, send any messages, make decisions about who our friends are going to be, who we're going to be in relationship with, who we're going to sleep with, what we're going to buy, what we're going to invest in. Everything needs to be viewed through our spiritual glasses, the lens of our faith in God. The psalmist writes it like this, open my eyes that I might behold the wonderful things of God. Paul says to the Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. There's an old absolute banger of a worship song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. In other words, let me see the world through a spiritual lens, which is my faith in God. This is what life was like for this little family. They were good at wearing spiritual glasses, of interpreting everything that happened to them that we read about in these four chapters through the lens of faith. And I just want to suggest four ways in which we see this in chapter one. I think there's a little slide to show it. Firstly, they wore spiritual glasses when it came to their identity. So firstly, Elemenek's name means this, my God is king. What a great name. (laughs) My God is king. His whole identity through the lens of faith. His parents must have wanted him to carry that as his identity, to pray over his life. Lord, for this child, may you be king. Later in the New Testament, the followers and disciples of Jesus began to say, Jesus is Lord, which is exactly the same thing about identifying Our very essence, our identity, that Jesus is king. Do you know, people identify as all sorts of things these days. But I'm with Elemenek. God is king. That is how I am identified. God is king of my life, and I want to live my life through that lens, as these people did. Secondly, they wore spiritual glasses when it came to blessing. In verse 6, the author adds this little detail, says this, the Lord has come to the aid of his people by providing food. So if you remember, there was a famine in Bethlehem, that's why they moved in the first place, and then it notes in the text that the famine must have ended. But they didn't just say, because the weather got better. They say, because the Lord has come to the aid of his people. In some translations, it says beautifully, God had visited Bethlehem. I love that. Instead of just interpreting it as some random thing, instead Naomi says, no, no, God did it. This blessing was God's hand at work. Everything is gift. To live through the lens of faith is to say that life isn't random. The blessings that I have in my life are gifts from God. Do you know, nothing cultivates generosity in us like the belief that nothing that we have belongs to us. If you want to grow in generosity and you want to get better at giving stuff away, stop believing that the stuff you have is yours because none of it is. Everything is gift. All of it is blessing. And this family understood that. They viewed blessing through the lens of faith. Thirdly, they wore their spiritual glasses when it came to considering future hope. In verse 8, when Naomi returns to Bethlehem, she prays over Orpah and Ruth. And she prays that God would show them kindness and give them new husbands. Naomi prays as someone who knew that God was faithful and therefore would be faithful. The word in the text here is kindly, and it's the word which is at the heart of Israel's covenant relationship with God. In the Hebrew, it's this word hesed, which means steadfast love and faithfulness. It's a major theme of the Old Testament. When Moses brings the people through the Red Sea and then he gathers them and they all start singing in worship, he says this in Exodus 15, he sings, he worships, he says, you have led your people 
in your steadfast love. It's the same word, hesed. God is faithful and shows his steadfast love. And so despite her pain, Naomi has experienced such tragedy, but despite it, she hopes in the future because she hopes in God. She is viewing the future through the lens of faith. Finally, this family have their spiritual glasses on when it comes to how they're processing sorrow. We read in verse 13 that Naomi's understanding is that God has turned against her, almost that God has willed the death of her husband and sons. Now, my understanding of God is that that is not what he does, that pain and suffering are not things that God wills on us. Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus in the same way that everybody else wept. Pain and suffering are part of the human experience, and Jesus came to triumph over all of it, not to bring it upon us. So I think a deeper understanding of what Naomi is saying here is that she views her pain through a spiritual lens, which says, God, it feels like you have turned away from me in this moment. And yet I trust in your provision and your future faithfulness. That seems a better reading because elsewhere we can see her praying. She says, in the one hand, God has turned away from me and made this stuff happen. But then she says, may God show us kindness. She believes for this and she believes that God remains good and kind despite the pain that she is going through. So I read her words as an anguished prayer. It feels as though, God, you've turned away which is frankly the way we are meant to pray, honestly and without a filter. God, it feels like this, and yet I trust in you. So here's a family who have their spiritual glasses firmly on. They are interpreting the world around them through the lens of faith in God. So let's for a moment talk about what other sorts of lenses we sometimes view the world through. What lenses are you looking through at the world right now? I think the most popular glasses that we all like to reach for are the me glasses. These glasses are the ones with self-actualization as the primary goal. These glasses suggest to us that to live well means to pursue the freest version of me that I can be and to push away those who might want to shape or speak or direct my life. Now, the attraction of this framing is that we can perceive that we're free, that we've got all this self-expression. This is me. And yet the downside is it can be so narcissistic, so disconnected from other people, and that all the momentum and creativity to be me has to come from me, which is essentially really lonely. I think another pair of glasses that we regularly put on is the glasses of achievement and success. We view the world all the time through success. And the world viewed through this frame is one where our identity and worth is found in the things we have done. How have I done in my exams or in my work? How am I doing in terms of how much money I've earned and possessions I've gained? I think sometimes we take this lens also, though, to our relationships. We measure our worth in whether we're in a relationship, whether we're married, how our marriage is going, has it lasted. But the major problem with that lens is that our definition of success is all wrong. Who said that our worth is measured in better A-levels? or a better degree, or a highly paid job. God didn't say that. Who said it's better to be married than it is to be single? Jesus never got married. 
These lenses of success are all about ticking things off in life, be that academically, professionally, materially, relationally. But Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul. He didn't say tick off all the things. I wonder that if we just view life through the lens of achievement and success, if we will just feel perpetually dissatisfied. Finally, I think a favorite pair of glasses that we reach for is control, which can be about all sorts of things. If I just control my weight or my habit or my routines, if I can try and find some kind of balance or equilibrium, then everything will be okay. But the problem is, is that actually mental and physical health can be really unpredictable, very difficult to control. And whilst habits and routines might help us to bring some kind of order to our lives, they can't really fulfill our deepest longings or desires. None of these lenses are the one. We are, I believe, to live as this little family does here in the book of Ruth, through the lenses, looking through the lenses of our faith in God. We need to reach for our spiritual glasses because it's through them that the world will make the most sense. We need to view other people through these, to be reading and watching all the content that we're surrounded with through these, to be absorbing all of the world's influences through these lenses, in order that by the power of the Holy Spirit, God can help us make sense of what is going on around us. This little family, we're good at that. And I think that we have got something to learn from them. So just as I close, just a couple of thoughts. Through what lens are you viewing the world? What could you learn from this family here? And if you do consider yourself to have a faith in God, are you really viewing everything through that lens? Or do you quite like to take your glasses off sometimes? (laughs) And just pick and choose a little bit through which parts of my life am I going to look through the lens of faith and which parts would I actually rather do my own thing. We hope you enjoy today's worship and talk. If you'd like to find out more about St Stephen's, please head to our website, follow us on social media or contact the church office.